Hello everyone, welcome to my studio. Today I wanted to show you a still life that I painted a while back. Anytime we get cut flowers in the house, I always like to scoop them up and make at least one quick painting out of them. I did work strictly from life, but I did want to show you a photograph of the scene that I was looking at so that you can see how I altered it. Uh, you don't have to always stick strictly by the colors that you see, and you don't always have to put everything into a painting that you're seeing. As often as not, it's just as important what you leave out of a painting as it is what you put into a painting. Now you can see I've begun the drawing process, and for the most part I keep my drawing relatively simple. I'm just trying to establish scale, proportion, uh, if there's any perspective involved, make sure that that's reasonably correct. And I don't try and get a super tight drawing because I, per I prefer to work fairly loosely. And if you get your drawing too tight, at times one feels obligated to stay within the lines. And that can very quickly make for a very stiff painting, something that is sometimes referred to as the coloring book effect, where you just feel like you have to stay in those lines. And I like a painting that has a variety of edges, both hard and soft. So keep the drawing simple and that can help you to avoid tightening up. I'm working on Langton paper, I'm almost positive. I really like it. It's, it's not a slick surface by any means, nor is it real, real absorbent like uh, arches. It's sort of a half me way medium between uh, arches and maybe Canson Montval or something like that. And it's just a, a, a real nice paper. I do prefer the rough. It's, I like that surface. It's got a bit of a tooth to it that kind of grabs. And also when you drag your brush, it can create a nice texture. So uh, I really like that. And you can see I'm beginning to block in my colors. And again, in keeping with not trying to stay within the lines, I'm allowing my washes to flow into one another. And that can serve a number of purposes. Again, not tightening up so much because it's uh, the edges are bleeding into one another. But another thing it can do, which is really nice, is it helps to make sure the colors relate to one another. It's real easy to do a painting and all of a sudden you've just got these islands of color that don't, don't relate to one another. And what is nice, especially about watercolor, is because it does run and bleed into uh, in, into itself, then you can put down an area of color and it will bleed over into another area. And that can give a real nice color transition where the two objects that you're painting will relate to one another and they just won't be sitting there in isolation. I do apologize. You'll notice that at times what is left of my hair apparently was frizzing that day and so it, uh, it'll it appear at, at times in the, the frame. I apologize for that. I didn't have the camera over far enough and I guess I should have had my hair slicked down. But um, that's what you're seeing sometimes drift in. The brush I'm using is a Chinese calligraphy brush. My wife buys me at Christmas and birthdays and things like that, just these little happies, just this little 
fun things that I wouldn't necessarily go by myself. And one day, because I talked about really liking Chinese brush painting, she picked one of these up for me. Now, it's a real cheap, real cheap, inexpensive, off-brand brush. But it just so happens that it wound up being a very good brush. It sat in my studio for probably 15 years just being sort of decoration. And then one day I was watching a YouTube video and I saw these Chinese painters and they were just amazing. They were painting traditional Western style watercolors, but they were using, boy, just seemed like everything but the kitchen sink. And one of the things that they were using a lot were their traditional Chinese calligraphy brushes. And I loved what they were doing, not the least of which uh, is because I, I like to I work fast and I like to work simple. And in the case of the Chinese calligraphy brushes, the Chinese don't have flats. Now they do have their hake brushes, but they do not have what we call flats. They have basically rounds. And these rounds are constructed in such a way so that if you put pressure on them at the tip, they will flatten out and form a very nice sharp edge. And, and then if you lift off, kind of twirl your brush a little bit, it'll go back into a round. And, and if it's a good brush, a good sharp point. So right there, you've got actually two brushes at one time in one hand. I just, I love that. So... I've gotten to where I use it a lot. Now it is cheap, so you'll notice sometimes I'm picking hairs out of it. Well, you know, they just fall out, and that's okay. Uh, you will also notice that I do swap between my left and right hand. For the most part, I can draw about as well with one as the other, and uh, paint as well with one as the, do the other. And I do that, uh, it's just strictly utilitarian. Uh, I work on deadline very often, and I don't have a lot of time to mess around. And so when I'm painting, if I can have one brush in each hand, especially if I'm oil painting or something where I'm pushing paint back and forth, then it really facilitates the process. It just makes it a lot faster. So uh, that's where you'll see me in my demos a lot of times. I'll paint on the le with the left hand. Especially if I'm on the left-hand side, I just paint it with the left hand. If I'm on the right-hand side, I paint it with the right hand. Now, of course, you want to do just one good pass, get the whole thing blocked in, and then you start your second pass. And with your second pass, you're beginning to define your shapes. You're beginning to refine them better. And this is where having your original drawing being an approximation and having your initial wash be something that's uh, soft and bleeding into from one, one shape to another. Now what we can do is as we're painting, we can preserve soft edges where we want them very easily because they're all soft, but where we want to carve out our image and really establish where our lights are meeting our darks, well, now you can do it. You'll notice too, and this is peculiar to the calligraphy brushes, the Chinese calligraphy brush. Sometimes they sort of bend and flop around, and it can be a little disconcerting at first, but once you learn that they're just going to kind of curve like that, you get used to it. You just sort of turn your brush and angle it however it needs to be, it won't be a big deal. I really encourage you, if you've never tried them, 
to pick some up. I can, I just bought some new ones and I can talk in another demo about them and where you can get them. But I would encourage you to always experiment, always play, never, never just fall into a rut of doing the same thing all the time because you never know. You might find that you've got a new tool that you really like. This is the beginning of, well, it's sort of a second-ish pass. In watercolor, it's really nice to try and restrict yourself to three passes, a, an initial block in, a massing of midtones, and then establishing your shadow shapes. If you can do it in three passes, it'll keep everything fresh. It keeps it from being overworked, overly precious, where you're just, uh, at times, just beating the thing to death. And by keeping it back to three passes, then you can say what you've got to say very quickly and move on. Because usually if you work too much, you're not, you're not adding anything. You're taking away more, more than anything else. And you see when I'm working down there in the marbles, when you're working with things like marbles, uh, grapes, anything that's just got a bunch of shapes that can get very confusing and very overwhelming, keeping things very simple, blocking objects into as simple of shapes as possible, combining shapes, seeing if you can't take, like with the marbles, two or three and shape them together at one time so that they're not uh, just hundreds of little disjointed parts, but they all kind of flow together, that will really help to simplify things and, and not, not get overwhelmed with detail. Now what I'm doing here where I'm working on the shadow under the cuff and under the gloves is as I'm working, you know, I'll also, and in the background too, I'm not afraid to drop in some random colors. Now some of that is, you know, if I see a hint of a color, then I'll drop it in. But also, you know, if you know a bit of color theory, then sometimes you can just drop in a color just because you know it's going to relate. It, it may be a compliment or it may be a, uh, on the other end, it may be if you're working in a triadic scheme or a split complementary scene or something like that, you might drop those in even at random just, just to give some color variety. I think you're going to hear some bonging in the background. I have a antique wall clock that um, is, of course, letting me know that it's 12 noon, and so it's going to strike 12 times, and uh, there's just nothing I can do about that. So we'll just live with it. Now, as I'm working on things like the flowers with the, the petals, you don't you don't want to get caught up in trying to do a portrait of a particular flower. It's not important that every petal be defined. What is important is that a, the silhouette shape is established so that we actually know what, what this is. But then going in and very carefully just looking and picking out a few petals that will give us some variety, make it uh, 
feel organic. That's all that's important. Just just a few passes, just a few dabs of paint, and you've said all you need to say about that particular flower. And now you see I'm working on the table. I'm just dropping in warm colors, just keeping the table. Even though the table was really kind of dark and somewhat cool, I didn't want it to be like that. I wanted to have the warmth down there so that it would be a nice uh, juxtaposition against the, and, uh, against the cool background. So I decided that I wanted it to be warm and so I'm dropping in all of these nice warm colors. Uh, some of them are quite opaque. Cadmium orange is very opaque. Cadmium yellow is as well. And that's where if you're working in watercolor, especially if you're someone who wants to really take advantage of its transparent nature, then just be aware that even within watercolor, there are some pigments that are far more opaque than others. And here you'll see I'm beginning to add white. Again, I uh, work a lot as an illustrator. I uh, am not particularly fond of real st strict dogmas when it comes to painting. Uh, 
I just want to make a good painting and however I get there is, is fine. So preserving the white of the paper, it's, it's got its validity because the white of the paper is so pretty. It, it really can't be duplicated with opaque paint, but I, it doesn't bother me one way or another. I'm usually, I just, I'm trying to get the painting done. And so I'll grab opaque paint anytime in the process and begin carving out shapes or popping in highlights at any time. Oh, and the, the color that I'm, the, the paint that I'm using is actually casein. You can use gouache. If you want, you can use oil paint, I guess. You just, you know, you would stop painting watercolor at that point and then use oil paint, which is fine. But um, in this case, I'm using casein. I like casein better than I do gouache. And there's not time in this video to go into that. I will at another time. Uh, gouache is fine, it's a great paint, but I prefer casein, and uh, carry, I carry a whole set with me, so that at any time that I want, I can just go opaque and begin to carve out highlights or uh, mid-tones, even shadows if I want to. but. I try to I try to do as much as I can with the watercolor, and if I don't need the casein, then I just leave it. But it's nice to have it there so that if I've got, like with the cup, the interior of that cup, well, I didn't want to mess around with trying to get a good hard edge and everything with the by preserving the white. And certainly with all of those little marbles and all their bright highlights and so forth, I didn't want to fuss around with all of keeping the white. So I just blocked everything in and then where I wanted to then go back out and reverse the process back out then I just use opaque paint And you'll see I kind of bounce back and forth. You know, I'll put something down, reconsider uh, with the flower petals. You know, I'll put one down and uh, decide that, no, nah, I didn't like it there. I'll cover it up, move it around. That's something people talk about with watercolor, that watercolor is so unforgiving. And it's, it's really not. Even if you don't use opaque paints to uh, as a corrective or just as a mixed media like I do, even if you're working in transparent watercolor, watercolor is very forgiving. Uh, you can lift out, out from the page if, if you're using a, a thicker paper, a heavier paper, 140 to 300 pound watercolor paper. My goodness, you can just put water on it and lift back out and get back to the white paper very often. Just be careful about staining colors like phthalo green, phthalo blue, those are pretty high staining colors and they can be a little difficult to lift out, but especially if you're using like an earth color or something that doesn't stain real bad, you just lift it out and uh, especially if it's still wet, it's real easy to just dab it back out, move things around. So don't, don't let people convince you watercolor is this unforgiving medium that once you put something down that's set in stone, that's Again, even if you're not using opaque paint, even if you're strictly doing tradition, so-called traditional wet and wet technique, watercolor is a very forgiving, very fun medium, and uh, you can do just a tremendous amount with it. Here, it's pretty much, I'm coming to a close, just touching up a little bit. I think I'm using <clears throat> a little bit of wet just water on the brush at times, just softening edges. <clears throat> and 
and I think I've gotten pretty much to the end and said all that can be said for this particular painting. So thanks for watching. If you've enjoyed this episode of The Arthropologist, please hit the like button. And if you'd like to see more episodes like this, think about subscribing. I'm Bill Wilson, and I'm The Arthropologist.